Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and this is your December garden to-do list and your question and answer segment. So joining me for that part will be Joe. Joe, say hello now. Hello now. I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) Yes. Um, I will go through the December to-do list. You just sit back and you come in when it's your time. And that is to read the questions and to call me out in case... I confuse you. And to figure out your microphone. I have to figure out your microphone as well. I got a new microphone. You do. So I should sound extra. Well, it should maybe cut down the editing. No, it, it's more sound quality. Oh. It's what, got nothing to do with editing. What were we listening to the other day? And I'm like, oh, yeah. oh it was um, Dr. Ledford, Joel, my friend. And he, I listened to one of his podcasts he did for um, the plant biology department. And I'm like, wow, it sounds really good. And you're like... Yeah, that's because they're both two guys with very monotone, even voices, not like me who, when I get excited, I start screaming, get really loud. Or if somebody else is talking Mm -hmm. on your podcast yeah, and they get loud and then you get loud and then they get, and you guys start shouting over each other. Wow. Just because we're so excited about talking about plants. I can't help if other people don't get excited about plants and don't show it by raising their voices to a very high octave is where you then have to edit it down so people don't get their eardrums blown out. Okay, great. But in reality, uh-huh. who has the best microphone technique ever? Oh, Huel Hauser. We were just watching oh it. God. We were just watching just it. Just watching it. Yeah. Well, I mean, Joe, he's a pro. Come but it's on. like from the, like the mid-90s. Well, and it's it's microphone technique, but it's also good microphone. I, I don't know what the editing. There's like, it was super windy where they were at and none of that is picked up. Zero. Not by him and not by his guests. And he just throws the mic over and I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was all done and edit. No. But even no. then, there's no way they could clean that up. No. They weren't editing that much stuff I, then. I don't know. It's amazing. You it's, listen it's to Huel. anybody like in the field now? It's yeah. horrible. It's awful. Yeah. It's Huel, Joe. Remember? Like genius. I know. Perfectionism. I know. Yeah. He's perfect. Um. Okay. So this is December. Wow. It's, I'm going to say well, what do you have? people say. I know. Hold on. What's going on? What have you been doing in the garden, et cetera, et cetera? You got to give some sort of update. Well, okay. So the garden. You've torn off out a lot of stuff out of the garden. Well, yeah, it's normal because you tear stuff out at the end of the season. I know that. Yeah. Um, it's been very cold. Yes. It's been very cold. We've had um, numerous days below 30 already. When I say 30, like 29. 28, actually, one morning. So I've had a lot of frost. So it's that same thing when you're like, oh, I might get tomatoes, maybe these green tomatoes. Um, you know, I know what once frost hits, but a lot of times it could be, you know, later, but no, we got some really cold frost. So those, I ripped everything out that, um, got frozen and my winter vegetables are chugging along. Um, kale, loose leaf lettuce, see some broccoli heads forming. So I'm not doing much. It's this time of year. I just sort of, I feel bad that I'm not in the vegetable garden too much. It's not, you know, I'll go in what they're to do in the garden, but it's been cold and I've had a lot of cat things. You have had a lot of cat things. And you helped me with one of them. Yeah. So I feed, two days a week, I feed these six fixed cats on campus. Yeah. Um, Another lady, Linda, she actually worked in the horticulture department for years. She's been feeding them for 10 years and then she had surgery. So I stepped in. And then I said, I could still do two days. Well, one of them um, got stuck in a tree for a while and I had to call you and the kitty was- I think you can go into it a bit. That was quite the ordeal. Yeah. So the kitty got him, first of all, Linda couldn't figure out where he was at for all day because he was like sort of throwing his voice a bit. And so they thought he was under a building in- <laughs> well, He was throwing his voice yes, a bit. Yes, like the little devil kitty he is. <laughs> Cats do that, Joe. Um, 
stuck in a building, under a building. So we were um, doing that. And then um, – then because it was dark by the time we went there. And it turns out he was up on a tree, but he was on the end of a limb that was overhanging about 30 feet of nothingness. And what happened is he got to the end of the limb and was weighing it down so he couldn't climb back up it. And the limb was attached to the tree? As limbs are. About 20 (laughs) feet higher. Yes. And so that limb was really, really far out and down. Yes. So you got on the roof. I went and got rope. You're trying to pull the branch down to get the kitty to at least get closer. To the roof. To the roof. Kitty um, got to the edge. Kitty, the limb fell away, sort of there wasn't any place to support him, and he's hanging on like that. You didn't see this. Linda didn't see this. I was watching this, but I never want to see that poster again where it's like hang in there of the kitty hanging because that's literally what it was, and then he let go, and I heard a really bad thud and Linda scream, and then we spent the next, I don't know how many hours, Trying to find him because we knew he broke something. Yeah, yeah. And then I had you destroy public property. Multiple times. Yeah, so the the environmental hort buildings on campus where I- You need to be so specific about where they were (laughs) at. (laughs) The coordinates are, anyways, those buildings Uh need to be demolished. They're not holding, they're holding very few classes in them. Some of the, their old trailers that have been there since the 60s, they're like literally rotting away. But I made you climb under a building. You got some asbestos on you. Um, anyways, um, Kitty didn't come out, but Linda and I every day try to trap it. And finally, we trapped him, brought him to the vet. And the little guy didn't even have a broken leg. He was limping for quite a while, but good for him. Pretty so, amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah. But that was an ordeal. Fire oh, yeah. department, UC Davis Fire Department calling them out. Oh, yeah. Did not come out. No. They have nothing else to do. Um, Arborist was willing to come out, but by the time they got back to me to confirm, he fell out of the tree. That's my drama. Oh, and I might have kidnapped two other cats, so I am up to 20. All fixed except for one that showed up literally the day after one of our male orange strays passed away. Another male orange showed up. The word is out, Joe. All right. Let's talk about December. Okay, don't sound so excited. (laughs) I'm just thinking about all the cats. (laughs) A lot of cat food. Feeding time takes a long time. It takes a long time. It does. Yeah, it takes a long time. Um, All right, so December. So yeah, we've been getting a lot of rain, which is good. We have. It's rained a decent amount compared to last year. Compared to last year. Okay. Compared to last year. I'm thinking if anybody else in the world is listening. Oh, yeah. I'm comparing it to what we normally get because that's all right. I could compare it to. Yeah. Because I've never really lived anywhere else but California. All right. So December, I'm just going to go through this. Can you plant anything? Well, yes, you can. If you find bare root asparagus, you could plant that. You could still plant fava beans, seeds or plants, bok choy, broccoli rob, garlic, kale, loose leaf lettuce, mustard, onion sets, and radishes. So that's about it. Can you plant perennials still? You can. Of course, not any frost-sensitive ones. And really what's restricting you for planting is the muddy um, soil. You never want to work really wet soils. So if you're digging into it and you have clay soils and it's just clumping, then you don't want to do that because that is going to just break down the structure and de- um, just get rid of all the air pockets and form little bricks. So that's really what's holding you back more um, is the wet soil. So, But I would say if your soil is pliable or dries, you could do California natives. Um, you could still plant some seeds um, of, sort of native, native um, flowers. You go ahead and scatter those. Bare root... Trees, roses, and berries. It's still early. That's going to be more January. But if towards the end of this month you happen to have your nurseries, go ahead and buy them. But it's the same thing. If the soil is sopping wet, still be very careful. You could keep them. But if they're in a bag, make sure you keep them out of rain because you don't want water getting in those those bags if they are bagged and filled up with water because then they're just going to rot. So protect succulents from water. Of course, if they're planted in the ground, there's not much you could do about it. But if you have pots of succulents out, bring them so they're not getting inundated with water. They are pretty much not growing at all. And too much water 
is going to cause them to rot. If they're in the ground, of course, you know, hopefully you have good draining soil. That's what most succulents want so they could overcome it. Uh, frost protection. I mentioned we've had some frost already. And this is, you know, it, people ask, oh, what, what succulent should I cover? What should I cover? Well, you know, every plant has a different sort of frost tolerance. So if you know the name of the plant, when in doubt, of course, Google its frost tolerance. But there are some plants that are just known in this area. Of course, avocados, bougainvilleas, certain citrus, uh, plumerias. Those are all sort of more common ones that do need frost protection. But within that, they have different levels of cold tolerance. Like certain citrus will, like mandarins, will take, you know, temperatures down to the low you know, mid-teens, whereas limes and certain Meyer lemons don't want to be below, you know, high 30s. Um, no, I shouldn't say that, probably high 20s. And then, of course, if something's young, it's not adapted. So you have a mature citrus, that's going to handle the frost much better than a young um, tree. So know your plant ideally, but when in doubt, of course, you can protect it. And how you want to do that, you've heard me mention, is make Ghosts, not lollipops. That means when you take your frost blanket or your sheet that you cover it, the whole entire plant, pin it to the ground or place it, you know, tuck it underneath a pot. Make sure a leafy plant is well watered in. So if you have, you know, we've had rain, so the soil is moist because that's going to radiate heat up. That's the opposite for a succulent. Don't water in a succulent. And succulents, you know, they're from all over the world. So when in doubt, if it's in a pot, bring it close to the house. But a lot of you know, succulents, if they're native to our deserts, they're going to be able to handle the cold. But if they're from, you know, some locations in South Africa, they might not be able to handle the cold. So if you don't know, just protect it. Of course, certain Christmas lights like the C7, C9s, but make sure they're not the LED ones. They're not the fake ones. You could wrap those ones around. Um, so, yeah, those are just some. And remove it the following day. If the frost is over, if we have like three days of known frost, yes, you could leave the coverings over it, but don't leave it on all winter. I've seen that before and I'm like, well, eh. and that can lead to other issues. You don't have a lot of uh, airflow around that. Clean up um, and, you know, don't necessarily remove all the leaves, all the debris from your perennial beds, your gardens. Remember, there are good bugs that are overwintering. Birds need a place, you know, some materials for their nests. So you want to create a nice environment. Your vegetable garden, yeah, if you've had viruses or diseases, clean all that up. Uh, spray your dormant trees. So for peach leaf curl, that fungus, normally it's, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Valentine's Day. Ideally, you get three sprays in with a liquid copper. You can mix it with an oil if you want, or just spray liquid copper. Um, spray everything, the whole entire trunk. If you could only get one spray in, i.e. it's been so rainy, um, that's better than nothing. You want to do it. Um, three times until, you know, the the buds break. So remember, because if you've had peach leaf curl, the spores are there. So you have a better chance of smothering the spores and having a less in um, sort of an outbreak than um, not doing it. And if you have bulbs still, if you have spring blooming bulbs, go ahead and put them in the ground still. It's pushing a little late, but um, if you have them and you forgot to plant them, go ahead and plant them. So and remember, don't really do any pruning right now. Your roses don't get pruned until January. Even fruit trees, I would hold off. I would prune fruit trees closer towards springtime. You don't want to prune anything that's frost sensitive. You don't want to prune anything now that's once flowering, meaning you don't want to prune camellias right now. They're setting buds. Some are even blooming. Uh, you don't want to prune your, your wisterias or your forsythias. Um, you don't want to prune your hydrangeas. You just want to clean them up. So, and anything frost sensitive, you don't want to prune because all that foliage, say bananas, you don't want to necessarily remove any of the foliage that's been hit by frost because that's acting as a blanket. So that's your December to-do list. Of course, you could start buying your, your seeds for summer. And um, yeah, so there's still stuff to do in, in the garden. Oh, and remember, right. well, I was going to say, remember, I'm coming at this from zone nine. So, of course, if you have a different, you live in a different zone, this could be different. I'm sure there are a few things different. There might be um, people who are adding hay to really protect some of their plants from the frost. Digging up, maybe digging up some things or things that we consider perennials here are annuals and they froze. What about the people that just live in the snow? I feel bad for them. <laughs> 
They live in snow. It's cold. <laughs> it's cold, Joe. It's cold. First question is from mm -hmm. Annette. Okay. I use a moisture meter to determine if my plants need water. Some people say they don't trust the meters. I just don't like putting my finger in the dirt. What are your thoughts? Annette. Well, my hands are always dirty. Absolutely no problem sticking my hands in the dirt. And I'm apparently not a trustworthy person because I do not trust moisture meters. So like anything, there's a big range in, in prices and quality. Okay, hold on. What? What do you what do you not trust about them? First of all, how do they work? What is it? Is it is it a binary yes or no? Does it give a range? It gives what a does range. It, do? it gives it a, a range. range. Yes. So okay. um I've worked very little with moisture meters. So I think when people say moisture meters, the ones like they sell at Ace Hardware, the ones they're freebies if you go somewhere to like a you know, a talk or something. It's just basically that metal prong and then it's a it's a gauge that reads. Those are What's it measuring? Moisture in the soil. Mm, I mean, if it's just a metal prong, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what it's measuring. Joe, it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, it's probably physics. This is not a physics podcast. Let's just... Joe, she didn't ask Marlene, how do moisture meters work? D was that the question? She did not ask that. Well, she you asked, have do this, I trust this them? harsh feeling this, against this is, them. Yes, this They're is like, more, I don't trust them. I actually think this was more of a psychological question than a science question. She's like, how is your trust with them? So I don't trust them. And you're trying to get me to explain how they work. That's to figure physics. out why you don't trust them. <laughs> um, OK, what, what I was going into is they're like five dollars. Obviously, the quality isn't is going to be as good as something that's more like one of the high-tech ones. I don't know. Maybe if I knew the technology behind it, maybe it was very basic. Maybe it only requires $5 for a yes or no. Maybe it's like a piece of, like a pH paper. Yes. Very simple. So, but here's the difference between, no matter how hard I try, no, that's not true. There are certain things that will cue me into if the soil's pH of something, right? Mm -hmm. And there are definitely cues that will cue me into if a plant needs water, and I do that. So what do you look for? What do I look for with water? Okay, so let's take a pot because at work we have to train students how to water and all of our plants that they're watering are in pots. So number one is if you don't have a lot of pots and you're at home, lift your plant up at the pot. Do it after you know you fully saturated it, meaning the water's run out. You know you've saturated it. Lift it up. Feel how heavy it is. Now. Then progressively do that the following days. There are some plants where, you know, worked at a nursery where you'd go move plants and you expect to lift something heavy. You know, you go lift something heavy and it's like, woo. So plants will definitely change weight based on the moisture level in the soil. So that's one way. Okay. At work, we tell, you know, it's not really feasible for large plants. But at home, if you just have some plants, definitely you could do that. Second is the soil color on top. Usually it's going to be more gray. If it's dried out, um, this doesn't always work as well because if you have old soil, there could be some moss grown on top. There could be roots exposed to the top. So that one, you know, we tell students, okay, sometimes if it's fresh soil, you could definitely see that there's moisture in it versus um, no, no, or there's moisture in it versus no moisture. But as the soil gets a little bit older, it's a little hard to tell. Um, and then dig down. And I tell this all the time is, you know, when the top three, four inches of soil gets dry, that's when you want to water. And sometimes that's, that is going to be the best way. But if your plant is pot bound, you can't really dig your finger down into the soil unless it's newly transplanted. Um, so I'm not going to say moisture meter isn't good, but it's just one tool. I would say start gauging moisture levels a different way. In the, in the garden, Take a shovel, dig down. Because a moisture meter isn't also going to go as far down. The moisture meters you buy at the store aren't going to go as far down. Say you need, are trying to water a large shrub and you're not sure. Or even a, a newly planted, like say a five-gallon citrus tree, those moisture meters are only going to go down like five, eight inches. You need to get down further. So take a trowel, dig down, even a larger probe. I think, uh, I think it was... Um, uh, Don Shore from Redwood Barn says that the, the really long screwdriver screwdrivers is his favorite tool. Yep. Car you, carburetor screwdriver. Okay. Carburetor screwdriver. There you go. 
question because everyone has one of those carburetor screwdrivers um, or any long thing. Yeah, just dig down or shove it down. You don't have to dig down. If it comes up, it's like, you know, doing an oil check in your car. I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so, if moisture, you know, if soil comes up stuck to it, then, you know, there's some moisture. If nothing comes up, then, you know, so, um, so no, I, I never use moisture meters ever. Okay. So here's my take. Yes. I think this is an experiential thing, something that over time, mm -hmm. and it's because you've been doing this for so long, mm -hmm. it becomes second nature. Yes. And the cost of time of using a moisture meter versus the quality of data that you're going to get out of that, there's no reward of using the moisture meter. So here's my example, my okay. kind of trashy example. Okay. Right? Yes. Okay. If I'm checking torques on a, on a bolt, right? Yes. All right. I can use a torque wrench, a very precise torque wrench. Yes. But I have a lot of experience in terms of tightening bolts over years, right? Mm -hmm. My first memory that I have ever is I was tightening a bolt on my ATC, I think at like the age of like three, and I broke it. And I remember that feeling because uh, it's like, oh, now I, I know what the feeling uh -huh. of like – Going too far on yes. a bolt is. Yes. And so you develop that experiential, tangible kind of mm -hmm. feel over time mm -hmm. from, again, you know, seeing successes and failures in terms of whatever you're doing. So I'm thinking probably that same thing applies when you're watering plants. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't, but I'm also saying use the moisture meter, stick it in there. If it says it's moist, dig down right afterwards and see if that reflects that. And then if it's coming out dry, dig down. Is it reflecting it's dry? And then do the other te tests. And then pretty soon you won't need a moisture meter because it, it really is, they can break. So it's set a baseline. Uh -huh. So yep. if, if she wants to get mm -hmm. comfortable, set a baseline mm -hmm. with the moisture meter. Yep. But then when immediately after she looks at that reading, uh -huh. start looking around for other Evidence or signs that she can refer to in the future to determine what the saturation level of the water is. Very good. Yes, yes Joe, you got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. There you go, Annette. I can't believe she doesn't want to get her hands dirty. How does she guard it? Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Annette, now she's going to kind of talk bad about you a little bit. <laughs> All right. Uh, Allison. Okay. How often should we be watering the yard during the winter? My husband turns off the sprinklers, but it seems like we still need them on occasionally because we don't have much rain. Well, that goes back to the moisture meter and digging down. Well, question. Answer. Do you have more feedback? Do you know what kind of yard she has? Do you know what no. kind of plants? No. This, this, this could be anything. Right. I'm assuming she might be talking about grass. Okay. Yeah. So I think you need to set the baseline here for what you're assuming Allison has in her yard. I was going there. Right. I was going to give all the different variables. Okay. Yeah. All mm -hmm. right. Go. Um, go. Oh, okay. Um, well, it all comes down to same thing. Dig down in the soil and see if it's dry or moist. But keep in mind that even if we don't have periods of rain, so say we don't, so, so we had some, you know, we've had rain, heavy rains. Say we don't have rain for the next two, three weeks, the chances of you needing to water at all, slim to none. One, because plants are not growing actively. They're not using the water required. Um, even your vegetable garden, they're, they're, they would, you know, they're more active growing than pretty much any plants out there. Um, your citrus is producing, camellias may be blooming. So, you know, they are actively growing, but it's much cooler so they're not um, losing water as much. They're not um, using much. So the needs of plants is greatly reduced. Um, so there, that, the, there's that. It's not hot, so you don't have a lot of moisture just being um, transpiring out of the soil at all. And uh, yeah, so between those two, your water requirements are a lot less and moisture stays in the soil. It's amazing if you dig down and you're like, wow, we haven't had rain in like three weeks, four weeks, and it's still very moist. And that goes for your lawn. Unless you have a winter-growing lawn, 
um, your lawns aren't even using that much either. So where you have to be worried about is anything that's covered by an overhang. A lot of people forget about plants that are under the eaves of your houses. Um, unless we have some side blowing rains get there, that could be dry. So if it's really dry, then yes, you're going to have to water those pots or those plants underneath there. But other than that, I would err on the side of turn those sprinklers off, dig down. Chances are you probably won't need to water at all through the winter. I take it a lot of that is due to our soil composition. Yeah. I mean, if we had really heavy sand, of course. Right. Yeah. But even then, even then sand does hold more moisture. And since it's so cool and plants aren't growing, you still wouldn't need to water nearly, nearly as much as, you know, obviously the summertime. Hmm. Okay. Next question. Diana, what are your thoughts on putting asparagus plants to bed for the winter? Okay. Um. What does that mean? I think what what you do for asparagus. So asparagus are perennial plants. I mentioned you could if you find them bare root right now, mm-hmm. you could plant them. So they are perennials, unlike a lot of vegetables. You know, it's it's once you plant it, you're gonna have them for years and years in there. Um, remember, you don't want to harvest the first two years. So right now, all the foliage is dying down. In fact, mine's really pretty. It's this really pretty yellow chartreuse color. I'm trying to get like a picture of it, but it's completely not green. So once it goes not green, you could cut it down. Um, And that's it. That's all you need to do. If you aren't having a lot of nice um, spears, i.e., you know, shoots coming up and it's been in the same bed for a while, you can dig them up and divide them right now. But you shouldn't have to do that unless, you know, they're, they're clusters of like five years or older. But those would be the only two things. You don't need to mulch them in this area. Um, just cut the dead foliage off and that you don't even need to cut it off now. Just I would cut it before the new growth emerges. Um, but that's it. Just cut the foliage down once it's completely brown. That is it. So asparagus is pretty easy. Yes. Okay. All right. Last question. Kathy, I received some pieces of Christmas cactus from a friend. I put them in water and the roots are strong. Can I plant them in dirt now? And if so, does it need a lot of water? Finally, should I keep it inside? Uh, Yes. If they have roots, definitely get them into soil. And even though they're a cactus, they are true cactus, they are from Brazil. So they're a tropical cactus that grows up in the canopies of trees. So they're called an epiphyte. So they don't grow in soil. So what they want is a, um, a light, airy substrate That holds moisture but has a lot of aeration around it. I have mine in more of a succulent mix. Um, So so I do have it more in like a true cactus mix, but it all comes down to how you you water. I would not put it in like a heavy peat soil though. And yeah, so don't put it in a pot too big, just a little bit bigger than the, the, the roots. And keep it inside. They can grow outside, but they don't like the cold, cold. And since it sounds like it's growing inside, you don't want to put it outside. That's too much of a shock. And so put it inside by a bright window. They're very easy to grow. Um, They need more water than a true cactus. Um, So just when the soil dries out a bit, go ahead and water them. And um, yeah, it's interesting is that, you know, they're called Christmas cactus, because they bloom around cacti- uh, Christmas time, but there's three different species, and there's actually the Christmas cactus. I don't know. There's three different species, and how you tell them apart is their 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 stems. So there's no leaves on them. Everything you see is stems, and so just sort of the edges of the stems denote if it's a Christmas cactus, an Easter cactus, or a Thanksgiving cr- cactus. And that's when they sort of all bloom at different times, and. It is said that th- what triggers them to bloom is the uh, day lengths, the amount of darkness and or the cold. And mine are getting ready to bloom right around Christmas time. And I think I'm trying to remember. So they're in the plant room, which is in the back house, which has no supplemental light. So when my lights for my timers go off, I think I have them go off. So I think they are getting those like like 14 hours of of at least 14 hours of dark. It's not probably why they're blooming. Yes. What do you mean they do not have any supplemental light? 
Well, so a lot of times if people have them in their house and the sun goes down, all the ambient lights around, like say you have your, your, your reading and you have your lamps on right. or you have your kitchen light on, they're getting more light. And if you don't go to bed until midnight, they're not getting those dark hours. Oh, yeah, but you have those lights in the back house go off like at 8 o'clock. Exactly. So they're getting plenty of dark. So if they're in the house... I mean, we don't go to bed much later than eight, no, but, but most people go to bed later. So they're like, wow, it's dark, but it's not. There's ambient lights on. So that could prevent them from triggering to bloom. Got it. So you're saying yours are in the safe zone because they're getting plenty of dark. Yes. Okay. Right now to initiate. Yes. Um, also- Why would you not have the lights go off even earlier to mimic the actual like, you know, true daylight cycle? Because most of the plants I have are tropical plants, so ah, they sort of got it. So yeah, it's hit, and yeah, hit, hit and okay. miss. Even though this is a tropical plant, which yep. yeah, it just has different needs yes. in terms of yeah. the, the uh, die. Is it diurnal cycle? Yeah, I think it's diurnal. Okay, yeah, mm-hmm. night, night, day, night, day. This is your field, not mine. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about. I'm gonna the let cold. you do it again, no. but just sound real like confident this time nah, is nah. it diurnal cycle i'm never i'm never confident about things like that no because i'm always confused about bi-monthly is bi-monthly mean every other month or does it mean twice a month yeah that's a stupid one we'll see i know um cold too so cold a drop in a temperature so say going from you know summer to fall could trigger it but then when people turn the heaters on inside that may prevent it so in the back where my plants are at I don't use the heater, so it's getting both. It's getting that drop in temperature and it's getting those long hours, so that's triggering it to bloom. So if you're not getting blooms, look at those two. It could be you have your heater on too much or you have all the ambient lights on too much. Um, Yeah, so – but no, they need more water than a standard succulent, but not as much as like a, quote, leafy plant. And yes, keep it inside for now. They can grow outside, but um, they don't like temperatures really below 45 unless they're protected. But since it's been inside, keep it keep it in there. Uh, I think there was one more question you just missed, Joe. Really? I have to do everything for you. Oh, my God. It's so difficult. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is. I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, no, I, don't I couldn't know. tell if it was a question. Oh, yeah. More of a yeah. statement. Well, so I'm going to modify it a little okay. bit. Mm-hmm. I recently purchased a banana tree from Costco. Do I keep it inside or will it live outside in the winter? So I pulled a lot of these because I put on Facebook, what should I talk about for my Sunday segment? And I got a lot of, hey, talk about this, but in the form of comments of what I should talk about instead of questions. So I decided I would answer them this way. So banana tree from Costco. Well, that doesn't help me a lot because I don't know what type of banana trees are from Costco. But I'm guessing I know pretty much which ones it probably is. Okay. So bananas could grow outside year round here in zone nine, assuming that it's one of these. Uh, So Cavendish is the most – Cavendish, when you go to the grocery store, that's the banana you get. And that's one of the most common bananas. And we grow them at work because we need them to bring into lab to show the tree of life. And we cycle through them so much. So we have like a surplus of bananas. So sometimes we decide, eh, we're not going to throw them away. We planted a whole bunch on a south exposure of a tall building. So in the winter, it gets the heat from the building and it gets that sun. And they're they're surviving year after year after year. They don't look great in the the winter. I get pictures where people are like, ah, look what happens to my banana. Don't prune anything off. It's acting like a blanket. Assuming we don't get an incredibly hard frost, i.e. below 25, they'll be okay. So Cavendish can survive outside. And then there's a few that are um, more of like the ornamental bananas, like the Chinese yellow banana, Musella laziocarpa. Uh, I think they call it the golden lotus. That could handle temperatures down below 30 a little bit. Uh, Musa baju, um, that one forms like a small fruit. That's one of the more cold tolerant ones. Um, It could get down to like negative 20 and still be perfectly fine. Um, So I'm assuming Costco gets ones that are equipped for our zone, I'm guessing. Oh, there's also the Abyssinian um, Ab- Abyssinian red one. So that's all those are musas and musellas and seti 
ventricosum is a non-edible ornamental but banana relative that, and you know this one, this one might be it because it has nice red leaves on it, that could get down temperatures to 20. So the problem here is if you just got from Costco, been growing in a nice greenhouse, then moved to Costco, it's warm, you bring it home and you stick it outside, that could be a little bit of a shock. But if you keep it inside, it's not going to be bright enough And it may not last through the winter inside just because of the lack of light. So I would put it up in the pot close to the house. If it's one of those, it'll be fine. And then the spring, you could put it in a pot out, plant it in the ground. Um, And if it's really exposed and we get temperatures like that, just throw a sheet over it. But other than that, they'll be fine. Um, Every once in a while, you know, the main mother plant will die down. But as long as the, the, the rhizomes down below are alive, it will send out new new shoots. Um, Problem with some of the edible ones like Cavendish is it does get colder before the flower set and the fruit set. So you may never get fruit. I think we got bananas off the ones at work a few times. So yeah. So once again, it depends on the species because there's a whole range of them. But in general, those ones could handle zone nine cold temperatures, even more so if they're up against the house. So yeah. That's it. All right. Um, good questions. Yeah, good questions. A little variety. Um, so if you have a question, you could email me at MarleneThePlantLady at gmail.com. You could direct message me on Instagram at MarleneThePlantLady. Um, follow me on Facebook, Instagram. Um, of course, follow me here if you don't do so already. And rate and review. I guess you could uh, rate on Spotify, and some of you have been doing that. That is nice. Um, some people on on Apple as well. And then tell a friend. Um, Yeah. So um, one day I might get a a Patreon going and all the Patreon money would go to um, feed all my rescue kitties and all the kitties that need help. So I haven't done that yet because that's always really uncomfortable. But uh, people do it for beer. I think. What? (laughs) Well, they joke. It's like beer fund because, you know, it's like these true crimes. They're like they joke. My cats don't drink beer. No. That I know of. Shoot, maybe they do. No. Mm. No, there's just a lot of cat food. I keep bringing in kitties. You do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. They know me at Tractor Supply now. Tractor Supply, though, by the way, very good pet food. Yeah. Yeah. Really good pet food selection. Yeah. 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 It's it's the the kitties outside. They, you know, they get canned food and they get dry food. It's not the super high-end stuff because, my gosh, that's expensive. Okay, my God. They get... I know. Like, I know. They get good stuff. Good food. Yes. And they have so many Because they're picky because I tried getting them, oh, you they know. Oh, they can be picky. Yeah. The really bad canned stuff. They were like- That was uh-uh. not the really bad stuff. Oh, well. It was just a like, they, they, not name brand. They dropped some stuff in the they suggestion revolted. box. <laughs> the suggestion box was full that day of, hey, I suggest you don't try to feed us this crap. Hey. Yeah. I suggest you go back to the store and get us good stuff. <laughs> it was a lot of suggestions. I'm not going to read you all the negative, negative ones. Yeah. And then we have a, I guess it's like a Siamese smoky yeah. point cat that showed up. I think his ears tipped. Can't get close enough. Yeah. To but he's, see. A, he's a fancy cat. He was a fancy cat. Way fancy cat. Way fancy. Yeah. Um, not yeah. small either. No. He's pretty big. No, he's pretty. Pretty kitty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I just stole a little gray kitty who's lived on campus for 10 years. He's cross-eyed. He's not small either. No, he's not nice either. <laughs> is, is that me Nor still? young. No, he's not so young. That's why- Your description of him was god-awful there. We're worried about him being in the rain and he was really wet. So yeah. yeah. And then I, anyways, I better stop. Okay. Anyways. All right. Until next time, everyone. Happy gardening.